which are not treating delta hepatitis today in the U.S. with pegylated interferon and treatment duration. But most patients and providers decline this treatment, but we do have a new medication, Levertide, that is conditionally approved in four countries in Europe and available through compassionate use programs globally. Pegylated interferon for hepatitis B does reduce HDV RNA levels and ALT levels. And this is of course divided into virologic responders and non-responders. We know that adding a nucleoside or nucleotide analog to pegylated interferon does not provide any further antiviral therapy for Delta. Although by suppressing hepatitis B, you may have improved patient outcomes. In a 10-year follow-up, outcomes of PEG interferon alpha 2A for chronic HDV is highlighted here. And if the patients were HBV DNA negative at any time, those patients had a much higher event-free survival, which means better survival, long-term. So virologic suppression does result in improved outcomes. This is Wiedemeyer looking at PEG interferon plus tenofovir, also, no improvement in HDV RNA levels, but tenofovir TDF or tenofovir TAF can result in effective hepatitis B viral suppression. And TAF has at least a numerical advantage over TDF in terms of ALT normalization. It's very interesting that we're now measuring correlated antigen and drug development going on globally. Correlated antigen is closely associated with transcriptional activity of hepatitis B, but it can also help predict response to pegylated interferon in Delta infection in patients who have combined infections. Now let's talk about these new and emerging treatments. The therapeutic targets include levertide, which I'll go into more detail at the end of this presentation. This blocks uptake at the NTCP or bile acid receptor on the basal lateral membrane. Immunomodulator alpha interferon we discussed is already available and pegylated interferon lambda is in development by Iger Pharmaceuticals. Your uh, molecule called a NAP blocks release of surface antigen by blocking the coalescence of surface antigen molecules. By blocking release, this can result in viral clearance. Prenylation inhibitors inhibit an enzyme called farnesyl and transferase. The prenylation process is required so the virus can be replication competent. MIR 301, a 48-week interim analysis that uh, was published last year, showed high and low levertide having similar viral efficacies at a 24-week interim analysis. The combined endpoint of normalized ALT and HDV DNA, HDV RNA suppression of more than two logs was this composite endpoint. Here we're also looking at improvements in intrahepatic HDV DNA and HDV RNA levels. RNA data is shown on this slide with a median reduction of 2.5 logs with a substantial number of patients having undetectable HDV RNA. Intrahepatic antigen and RNA levels are shown here with the lever tied two milligrams and 10 milligrams, showing two milligrams and 10 milligrams had similar efficacy. And the two milligram dose is what is conditionally approved in Europe and being uh, looked at and applied for approval in the US. There was an early access program using blue lever type plus pegylated interferon for chronic delta infection in the French early access program called the CATU. Here we have virologic suppression over time in the combined group that were undetectable or greater than two logs for composite endpoint 94%. Normalization of ALT was in about half of these patients. We'll get back to the levertide in a moment, but I'm now going to shift to lonafarnib or tonavir, which boosts lonafarnib levels by inhibiting cytochrome P450 and combining with an innovative new product, pegylated interferon lambda. And you can see that we have a substantial number of patients with undetectable or below limit of quantification 
showing a benefit of combined interferon and low nefarinib treatment. The DELIVER study here is a forearm study, including placebo. The 48-week trial, this trial is fully enrolled and we're awaiting data lock and information which should be available at the end of this year. This is looking at Replicor's compound 2139 and pegylated interferon outcomes at three years. 3.5 years is shown here with a high number of individuals with normal ALT, improved liver stiffness, S antigen decline or less than one IU, S seroconversion, an HDV RNA response greater than two logs, an 82%, undetectable 64%. We want advanced practice providers to be involved in managing Delta with these new agents we need to expand training as these new treatments evolve. Guidance is shown here. If you have an elevated ALT and an S antigen positive patient, you're going to check delta antibody, delta antibody positive. Of course, you're going to check delta RNA quant and HBV DNA quantification, high DNA level, and I'm going to say any measurable HBV DNA. I will be treating with a nucleoside or nucleotide analog. HDV RNA positive, strongly consider pegylated interferon, awaiting for one of the many therapies. Decompensated cirrhosis is a contraindication to pegylated interferon, of course. And if they're both elevated or positive, combination therapy would be advised. A little bit more on pegylated interferon. We have type 1 interferon, interferon alpha. We have type 3, which is interferon lambda, which is in development. These modulate STAT and a variety of other genes. Lambda is very liver specific. So this may benefit clearance or if there's extra hepatic sites of viral replication, this may be a decrement for lambda interferon and the studies are currently pending. This is adding or switching pegylated interferon. This is an interesting data uh, that comes from hepatitis B patients alone thinking about putting patient on an injectable or oral agent and then adding pegylated interferon to Delta treatment is another consideration. We're gonna go back to the lever tide now with a little bit of a deeper dive. You can see here that this first binds not to NTCP, but the heparin sulfate glycoprotein then moves to NTCP as the virus moves across, but the levertide binds directly to the NTC group receptor and prevents this handoff from the HSPG to the NTCP receptor, thereby blocking uh, uptake into the cell. We have just seen at EASL one week ago, the primary endpoint analysis at 48 weeks, looking at no treatment versus the levertide versus versus 10 milligrams. So we have two milligrams versus 10 milligrams, noting this is a two to three year study, but this 48 week time point is what's gonna to go to the regulatory authorities for uh, clinical approval. That combined endpoint, two log reduction or undetectable normal ALT, nearly 50% of these patients reached that combined endpoint. Further data on the more granular information in this trial is available through the EASL website. And we will talk about very mild adverse events, no significant flares of liver disease, no decompensation, uh, and uh, a well-tolerated medication, noting that this is a daily injection. Back to the CATU, the levertide plus peganiferon, which I think will be the standard of discussion, not necessarily the standard of treatment, but the standard to discuss this with patients. Um, and the high cure rates that we talked about above were already mentioned, but here I'd like to highlight that when you use bulevertide, you have high bile acid levels, but these bile acid levels in the CATU study and also in the near 301 study were not associated with any significant side effects. Need more information on this early treatment options for Delta hepatitis, please go to the CCO website. You can also go to robertgish.com. I wanna thank you again for having me here today for this very important presentation. 
idea now for hepatitis B patients is test all B patients for Delta antibody, Delta antibody positive test for RNA, RNA quantification positive offer treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gish. And now um, I'd like to invite Dr. Do Van Dung from the School of Public Health, University of Medicine and Pharmacy, Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, dear Professor Chairman and uh, dear uh, the organizer committee and everyone, uh, first of all, I would like to extend my uh, uh, thank thanks to uh, all of you of to invite me to a very honored occasion. And today I would like to uh, present a report on the uh, uh, co-infection of the viral hepatitis among the pay 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 uh, people with uh, SIV. And uh, bear for me one minute so I can upload my presentation on the Zoom. Okay. That's So I think Dr. Zung is preparing for his presentation and maybe we can wait. Yeah, I'm preparing for the starting with my project. Thank you so much for, thank you for your understanding. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, And uh, uh, this is my presentation. The text in Vietnamese, but I will speak in English, and so that uh, our Vietnamese colleagues can uh, easy to understand and uh, follow my presentation. And uh, today, I would like to say about the viral hepatitis and cirrhosis among the patients with HIV. And uh, the, in this presentation, based on the research evidence, I uh, would like to raise a voice. Uh, for on behalf of the people living with HIV uh, for the key message. That is, uh, when we would like to provide health care for people living with HIV, uh, you, you need to pay attention to the uh, liver problem of the, uh, of, the, the, uh, of the people. And when we had a program uh, uh, to prevent and also for treatment, uh, on prevention against the viral hepatitis, we need to pay uh, attention to the population of people with HIV. These are very important uh, population. And uh, first, this our key message. The key message I have five key message, and hope we hope that after the presentation, and we can uh, 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 we can go through the key messages. Us and HIV still a public health problem in Vietnam. And uh, now we are more than 214,000 people living with HIV in Vietnam. And we know the co-infection of HIV with the HIV and uh, very high uh, in DZ population compared with general population. And also the HIV and uh, HIV and HIV uh, prevalent is much more uh, higher. And we understand that co-infection with viral hepatitis with people with HIV uh, reduce the survival and increase the uh, severe progression uh, toward the cirrhosis and liver cancer. And but we can treat the this co-infection and we also can prevent the uh, uh, epidemic being infection in these people. And uh, firstly, with the vaccination. So I would like to present about the situation of HIV in Vietnam. And uh, this is the slide to show the HIV S and the S mortality by year in Vietnam. And we can see that uh, uh, we start to have the 
has been fashioned in Vietnam in the 1992. And gradually, we have increased the number of the people with HIV in Vietnam and its highest in the 2007. But uh, recently, it's reduced a little bit. But uh, since the 2018 to now, we have the small increasing of people with a new cases of HIV, mostly from the people having sex, from the men having sex with men. And uh, that is, and especially we can see that in different regions, we can no, know that in the North, the, not many people, uh, the total, the contribution, uh, the contribution of the new case is the higher in the South. For example, in Ho Chi Minh City, they account for 26% of the new cases uh, recently. In the Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast of the Vietnam, and 27%. Why in the Hanoi, just only 8%. And with that, we can have the, uh, we can see uh, with, with treatment, the, uh, the number of the death de uh, decreasing gradually. So we have a lot of people living with HIV and they are under the treatment. So uh, the question is that how we can improve health the people and uh, in Vietnam and in general we understand that the UNS the strategy to uh, uh, have a, for intervention of HIV and we all know the 191990 uh, target that is we had a 90% of the patient with HIV uh, can discover their uh, the the status by uh, testing and for the one with uh, positive result, ninety percent of them will treatment and for the ninety percent of people who have treatment, we can have the viral uh, undetectable. And with that, uh, uh, with that target, we hope that we can reduce the incidence and also the mortality in the world and in so in Vietnam. And therefore, now almost every patient who has been uh, discovered to be HIV positive will be under the treatment of ARV. And, uh, but we can then, thanks to the ARV treatment, we can really, uh, we can improve the life efficiency with people with HIV. For example, if there is no treatment, there will be the difference in level with the S, uh, with people with SM infected and with the people without SIV infection uh, up to 13 years. But if we have a good treatment, we can reduce the number, but uh, by about eight years. Uh, but uh, but we, we think that can we improve more and we can reduce the gap of the survival from the infection and non-infection. And in this study, they find out that the only uh, three intervention or three important risk factor, uh, if we can solve, we can improve the gap, we can re uh, close the gap. That is hepatitis, viral hepatitis B or C, on the drug abuse and smoking. And that is besides the smoking and drug abuse, it is the medical and social problem. But the hepatitis B and C, mostly the medical problem. And now in this presentation, I say that we, if we would like to provide good care for people with SLA, we need to pay attention to hepatitis B and C. So why is, is it? And this is uh, the topic I would like to say that is the co-infection with uh, SFB and viral infection uh, is the public health problem because the co-infection is the most important cause of death among the people with SFB. Uh, here you can see, I said again, you can see again the, uh, the table that I present in the previous slide. That means hepatitis C and C is very important uh, problem to solve to close the gap between the survival of infection and non-infection of HIV. 
But when we see the contribution of the debt to different uh, costs, and they say that of, uh, uh, obviously for the patient with SIB, and S-related debt is the most important. And especially that it's very important to, to someone with low CD4 cell, we can see here. But if we have good treatment, uh, just for now, we can have people C4 more than fine bread. And we can see in that case, the S, uh, S related debt is just, for example, in this study, so only 11 cases in this uh, situation. But we can have 21 people dying because of liver related debt. This so means if we now we after we have provided to meet the target of 1990. And the next step, and which is very important, is that we need to focus on liver-related death and prevent the liver-related death. And this uh, paper from this paper, paper uh, liver-related death is patient infected with human immo uh, immunodeficiency virus. And this study, they saw that liver-related death is the most important cause of death for people in SFA especially for the patient with the uh, higher CD4 cell and for the good treatment of ARV. And also, and that is the next question is why? We understand that uh, uh, for the patient with SAV and they can have some medical, uh, medical problem can have the negative impact to the S related death. For example, with the cardiovascular disease. For someone with severe cardiovascular disease, we can see that for someone who has not get the cardiovascular disease and the risk factor, uh, risk structure is just one. But if they had the cardiovascular disease, then then S related death is more higher, up to four. Uh, the risk structure is up to four. But it's not true for hepatitis. For hepatitis, even you get hepatitis, see whether you're negative or positive, and then the, the impact to the s rate depth is unsilicon. But vice versa, the, uh, the SIV status in the another table, but it, it's not here. To show that uh, for different level of the CD4 cow, that means uh, that's mean for the for severe case, uh, for the more severe uh, uh, SAV status. And then the SAV status can affect negatively to the liver related death. You can see it here. So SAV related to death. And also the SAV and SAV status also to live for example for someone who uh, with SV status positive and the risk is up to 10 and for the SV positive especially for active and uh, and risk ratio is 6 so it's a very important uh, problem to solve the uh, SCV infection and SPD infection especially for the positive and active uh, active uh, speed. We also we we if we had an uh we do not need to provide treatment for inactive evidence uh, it can be uh, uh, infection. And that is uh, the reason why we now understand that for patients with uh, uh, HIV and then the SCV and HIV infection very bottom and increase the reliever related depth. So the next question is how big is the problem? Now I would like to say about the uh, prevalence of co infection of HIV. It's 
and co-infection of HPVN in the world in general. Uh, that means uh, we use a meta-analysis, and then I would like to go back to the Vietnamese situation. And this is the uh, meta-analysis for the prevalence of hepatitis B and C in HIV infected patients. They, with different study, they saw that the prevalence of the HCV, HCV co-infection is about three times than the prevalence of co-infection of HBV and HCV. So that is so the key, the more the, the problem of HCV co-infection in the people. In Vietnam, uh, uh, and then uh, I would like to say about the uh, meta study, at least 20, they do the uh, systematic review of 22 uh, study on about 17,600 patients. And they can see that the prevalence of HCV co-infection is about three times. But uh, for if they had uh, HCV and HIV infection already, and there is no difference between the HIV co-infection in this. And uh, uh, this result is consistent with the result we found in Vietnam. And this is study of HIV and HIV co-infection in the National Hospital Tropical Diseases. And uh, we, they have the subsects and the patient with HIV uh, visit uh, our patient clinic. And about 50% of them have co-infection with at least one viral hepatitis. That is, you can see that co-infection is a very severe problem in Vietnamese patients with HIV. And we can see that the prevalence of the HPV co-infection is 8.4%, about one fourth of the HPV co-infection, about 35.4 problem. Is consistent with the result of the systematic review. And we can also that relate to the number of the triple co infection, SCV, SBV, and SAV, is about 6 by uh, 5 uh, percent. And it's very important. And uh, here we can say again, and the co infection is SCV, SCV about four times, then SCV, SCV. And mostly the case, they find the risk factor for the co-infection HPV and HIV, that is they get HIV boosted by the sexual transmission. For the group of the uh, HIV and HIV co-infection, the risk uh, factor is the the uh, intravenous. So again, you can say, I will say that again, in Vietnam, we had the same problem and more severe problem going fix them. And also the uh, the more important of SP is uh, also found in Vietnam, similar to other countries. So why HIV is very important? And uh, uh, and we now we talk briefly about the uh, uh, effect of HIV in, uh, in hepatitis. Uh, it has been, I think this is very, uh, 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 the, that issue has been explored by many speakers before. So I don't want to say uh, too much about the etiology and also the mechanism of treatment. I also to summarize the key things. And this is the one slide uh, to show that the, uh, what is the essential, the risk factor, if we had a co-infection of HCV and the HPV and HCV and the HCV. But I don't want to spend time on this because I say briefly again, that is when, when we use the intervention of using and we can have more co-infection of HCV and HCV and with the uh, sex in uh, sexual intercourse relating to HCV and HCV co-infection. Then if the if the patient with the co-infection and we can know that the uh, treatment will be had more problem. Uh, first of all, we can understand with the patient with the liver uh, with hepatitis, and therefore can more ask for event 
and also the cold treatment can have a drop in the reaction. That is the problem for the treatment. But uh, beside that, we know that with the SAV and when the disease progress to S, we know that S will increase the viral replication and also reduce the immunity again, the hepatitis. And therefore, if you expose to the viral infection, usually you may go through the acute hepatitis and stop. But if you had the uh, immunocompromise and about 10 to 50% you develop the chronic hepatitis B, therefore die, we have more the patient with the chronic hepatitis. And for the treatment, also, if the patient use the IVR treatment and they may cause the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, with that, the inflammation reaction is very severe and can, can cause the liver injury. And that is problem uh, relating to SVD, SVD co-infection. And also for the patient with SVD co-infection, and STD coefficient, they also find out that the, with the patient of SCV, they had a more viral load of SCV than with if they had a mono alone. And the cytokine production, cytokine production, and also cell apoptosis, and also the problem, the thrombocytopenia, occur more frequent with the patient with the co-infection of SCV and SIV. And uh, the gen then with the uh, anism, uh, then can go uh, in general, they can find out that about 19% higher of liver progression and non palliative organ distribution. And also an increase the risk of liver fibrosis and cirrhosis. And with the fibrosis, cirrhosis, and also, the chronic hepatitis can cause increase five or six risk uh, of the hepatocellular carcinoma. And therefore, the co-infection gain more not only the CD case of the hepatitis, but also they increase the proportion of cirrhosis and SCC, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So the question is that we know that we can need to solve the problem of co-infection, but how we can arrest the problem? Is there any difficulties for treatment abilities in the patient with SIV? That is the final part of my presentation. And WSO has the uh, uh, suggestion that we should have the uh, we should have a target for elimination of HCV uh, and SVB. Uh, we can similar to SAV, SAV we had a 90-90-90% uh, target, but also SBC we can hold also the target for testing about 90% for SVB and SCV, but not the year 2020, but the year 2013. And for the treatment, we made the target of 80. And that is for general population. And I argue that we need to also provide the, uh, the we need to improve and meet the target for the patient with HIV because that is the HIV, the coefficient of real problem to them. And also we need to uh, solve the problem by using uh, some strategy for vaccination, that means we need the uh, three dose of the vaccine to prevent hepatitis B, and uh, for prevention, mother to child transmission, and we need to provide the first low coverage and uh, injection safety, especially for the patient with HIV, and usually they have the risk behavior. And the harm reduction strategy is very important. We need to provide the syringes, needles, and uh, uh, to be needed, uh, distributed to them. Uh, and that is the overall program. But now we focus on the uh, more in the treatment of the people. And 
And so first, I will give you about HPV. And HPV is still a chronic infection, but it's preventable thanks to the vaccination. We understand that vaccine can reduce the uh, risk of the getting HPV infection about 80% and can reduce the chronic HPV up to 90%. So vaccine is very crucial. And uh, in uh, pre pre uh, previous presentation, we also discussed about the renewed the mother to child transmission for HPV. Uh, the strategy of the using xenophobia for pregnant women and using the immunoglobulin for hepatitis B and the pub vaccination of hepatitis uh, uh, B reduce the risk of infection to mother and child. And uh, for that is for the mother with the high risk. Uh, for the general population, uh, both vaccination and uh, also the, uh, the testing, HPV testing, and mass treatment can reduce the mother child mission. About the treatment, uh, we know that uh, in one presentation has a view that uh, we can cure HPV, uh, HPV. The problem is that, only problem is that not predictable and uh, uh, the rate of cure, uh, cure HPV is very small, about one or two percent every year. But uh, we can increase the rate of cure by using the back interferon. Uh, but the problem of interferon is more the uh, asphalt event. And the using nucleoside and nucleotide has a lower uh, risk uh, side effect, but uh, the rate of the cure uh, of uh, for cure, for cure, the SPV is uh, lower uh, than uh, using the vaccine drug. Then now we move to the question more crucial: whether we should treat uh, what which kind of the patient with SPV uh, with co-infection we can treat the drug. And uh, uh, in this slide, uh, I would like to rely on the guideline uh, for the people without HIV. And I will back to the people with HIV. Uh, we understand that uh, for someone with the immune tolerance, if they can have very high STD DNA, they can have very high uh, surface antigen and positive of the E antigen. But because of the immune tolerance, that the liver tissue is uh, intact. It's not very severe injury. And the ALT is normal and liver disease is minimal. And we do not treat, need to treat this patient. Also, we don't need to treat the patient with the very low, uh, if they have this, uh, strong immunity, but the successful immunity, that means they have low surface antigen, uh, they had a negative E antigen, but also they were successful, that means we had a low, very low uh, uh, viral loss, at least than 2,000 units per million, and then we don't need to treat. We can also need to treat someone uh, with high ALT, with the, some manifestation of liver disease, and also they have the, some immunity again, SPV, but not successful. The problem is very clear. So, but the problem is that sometimes that is the, uh, the standard pattern. But in fact, we can have that standard pattern. For example, uh, if the patient, you can know that they had the, uh, uh, they had the E antigen negative. And if uh, they had an the antigen negative, and they have very successful uh, of immunity, and we uh, in that person they can low, they can have a, a low viral loss, low than two thousand units per million, and they had the ALT normal, and definitely we don't need to treat. 
but in fact, and someone you can help had if they had an uh, HPV infection negative, uh, but they had a high DNA, that means they had immunity, but not uh, success, so successful, and you need to treat with neoplasty and the butai, like xenophobia, etc. And that can be different. But <coughs> it's not only uh, uh, consistent with the standard pattern. Someone we can, can have low, <coughs> we can have very uh, low DNA very lot, but also very high at ALT. And someone who can have the low very lot, uh, high very lot, but the low ALT. And so that is, uh, we need to to be uh, more, we need to put more, more factor in consideration to decide whether we provide treatment or not. Uh, but uh, thanks. Uh, but in general, we can apply this uh, strategy to the patient with the co-infection of HPV and HPV uh, But for the patient with HPV and HPV co-infection, because the HPV co-infection is always uh, increase the ALT, and then therefore uh, for the side for treatment with the HPV, HIV. HPV co-infection, we don't need to pay attention to ALT, we need to pay attention to only SAPE negative or positive, or also to the DNA. Uh, and we can ignore, for example, uh, my your opinion, if we can ignore the prey box like this. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so in summary for the SPV, we have uh, we have very good chance of prevention with the SPV vaccine, but uh, the treatment is more complicated, and with the rate of cure very low. Uh, is the contrast with the SPV infection? Uh, SPV infection, we in the for prevention with vaccine, we uh, we currently we do not have very good vaccine. Although we had a very, uh, uh, we, we can hope that in the new future, we can have a vaccine uh, with the uh, adenovirus-based vaccine. Because in some study, they saw that can make a pro and certain T cell responses to HCV in men. But uh, it's uh, for the near future or near future. But we have a very good achievement for HCV already. Uh, previously, we need to use interferon and riparvirin, and we understand that for uh, the the certain response rate is uh, rather low, fifty five percent, and the time treatment is very long, and relapse is rather high. If we use the direct acting antiviral, uh, just right now, sofosbuvir, for example, we can renew the time treatment and we can have the uh, certain viral response, not more than 90%. The key things to the SCV, especially for the patient with the SCV, because they are someone uh, may use the intravenous drug or they can have the, some uh, risk behavior, sexual behavior, like the men having sex with men. Are having many partners, and therefore we uh, the the chance of again reinfection is very high. So the only consideration for the treatment for infection of HIV and HIV infection is we pay attention to the drug interaction and also the reinfection for the patient uh, for someone with the high risk. And we uh, like in the for the target by the WSO, we need to uh, screen test uh, at least one high for the patient with SAV to find someone who has the SAV and Wi-Fi uh, treatment. And uh, with that, we understand that we need uh, with treatment with DAA for SAV, we need to combine with the testing services and also with the harm reduction uh, strategy. So that is the end of my presentation. I would like to reiterate uh, the key message. 
SIB is still a public health problem in Vietnam, and more than 200,000 people in Vietnam still getting, uh, will still live with SIB. With them, the SIB co-infection and the viral hepatitis is a crucial problem, and this is the main cause of death of them, especially for someone with the wood treatment with ARV. And in Vietnam, the co-infection rate prevalent is very high in the patient with SIV. We need, if we would like to provide good care, good health care for patients with SIV, we need to consider the treatment and prevention of the viral hepatitis for them. And we know that for the treatment, and if we do not treat them very well, and because of many mechanisms, the progression of the uh, hepatitis is uh, rapid and also toward the fibrosis, cirrhosis, and the hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, but we should uh, provide the testing service of SPV and SCV for all of the patients with SCV. For someone who are SPV negative, we should provide vaccination for them uh, SPV vaccination. And for someone with the active hepatitis with hepatitis B and the treatment with nucleoside is the can reduce the risk uh, of progression and to the uh, liver cancer. And uh, for someone with hepatitis C infection, uh, we need uh, we can provide treatment for them with the direct acting antiviral. And we need to uh, combine with the harm reduction with the health education to reduce the risk behavior and uh, combine with testing service so they do not uh, reduce the risk of the uh, reinfection. Uh, that is the own of my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind uh, attention. Thank you, Professor Zung. And now we will have our final presentation today from Dr. Tang Kim Hong from uh, the uh, Faculty of Public Health from the University of Medicine, Ho Chi Minh City, please. This is my pleasure to uh, present today, uh, but I trust the uh, representative of team member. Um, actually, this is not only... What I present today is just a, a hard work of a team, uh, including many uh, people here, like uh, Miss Zim, Miss Lop, uh, even Zhuang, and uh, many, many people. Um, so I, I just want to uh, present the parts of our work. And um, this uh, already uh, published in the Lancet Channel. Uh, first, As you all know, 
uh, chronic liver disease caused by hepatitis C uh, is uh, still a significant uh, global public health problem all over the world. Uh, and uh, approximately with the 71 million people affected. Um, in 2016, uh, the, the global elimination targets by uh, set by WHO um, include uh, it, at least 90% of those infected diagnosed, 80% of those illegal treated, and 90 reductions in the incidence of new infections and about 65 reduction in liver related mortality in by 2030 uh, actually uh, we already know that there's this, what we call uh, micro elimination uh, that means we just break down the elimination goals into smaller goals for specific populations or geographic areas. And that means um, with different, um, uh, like smaller elimination goals, we have a different treatment intervention applied uh, using target uh, methods. Uh, and we already know that for HIV, the micro elimination or, uh, was very successful in uh, demonstrating successfully in uh, uh, treatment of HIV. And now it's uh, recently, uh, it has been promoted for HCV uh, elimination. Uh, so that means before we can set up the, the goals, we need to, 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 to understand the problem. That means we should base on the reliable uh, epidemiological data, including baseline gaps in uh, caskets of care to be overcome and monitor and active uh, involvement of own uh, stakeholders. Uh, for this reason, we, um, we try to uh, collect data to determine the prevalence of uh, SCV infection in adults resident in Ho Chi Minh City and define the unique baseline uh, epidemiological profiles of uh, SCV with a focus on uh, the caskets of care in Ho Chi Minh City. And uh, why uh, the team select Ho Chi Minh City? Just because we, um, we're from Ho Chi Minh City. And we established, um, we have established a track record and infrastructure in the city. So that's the reason why we established a baseline assessment to promote SCV. And um, yeah, we, conducting a cross-sectional study. But before the cross-sectional study in 2020, we already did um, smallest uh, cross-sectional study in uh, SBV, and we got some experience from uh, that cross-sectional study. But um, for SCV, the cross-sectional study were conducted from June uh, 2019 to July 2020. And uh, you all here know that what happened to our city and our, um, uh, like uh, for the whole uh, world uh, in 2020. But uh, in June 2019, we based on the prevalence of anti HCV uh, posi uh, positive anti uh, HCV, and we, um, we we calculated uh, the sample size uh, up to uh, four thousand five hundred 
participants. But after that, we multiply by 2.5 because we apply uh, multi stage multi cluster sampling. Uh, so that's the reason why we need to account for our desired effect. And also, we should uh, account for non response uh, right uh, and based on uh, prior experience, we estimate that around 40%. So uh, the sample size from the beginning is around uh, 18, 18, 18, uh, 60, uh, 18,000 participants. And uh, we plan to expand it. We plan to expand to to, to 2,000 uh, 20,000 uh, for potential uh, attri uh, attrition. Uh, let me explain about the, the multi stage cluster sampling because that means uh, we uh, first we apply the, um, uh, we select the commune. The commune were, uh, we, uh, calculate and um, we selected 100 communes among 332 communes of Ho Chi Minh City. That is the first stage applying uh, PPS sampling. And for the second stage, uh, from each commune, we select two neighborhoods in Vietnam. We call Tổ Dân Phố. Uh, how we select uh, Tổ Dân Phố? That means we choose using the simple random sampling from each commune. And we assume that for each household, at least two adults for each household. So that means with uh, about 50 households for uh, each neighborhood in each we finally got uh, 100 adults for each commune. And how to select the household? We um, just conveniently choose the first household in the neighborhood and then just go one by uh, door by door from um, and continue to the nearest household on the right until we got enough household needed. And in case that the neighborhood or the especially in the uh, urban area, in urban area like District 1 or District 10 for some communes, uh, the number of household for each uh, neighborhood, uh, the number is sometimes uh, did not reach 50 households. For that reason, we, um, we went to another neighborhood next to that neighborhood we selected. Um, and uh, we uh, expect that for the each commune, we have 200 participants from each commune and all family members even though for some household, if they, um, the number of uh, adults in each household more than two, we also uh, sent the invitation package and invite them to, to, to go to um, community health center for uh, being surveyed. And uh, what we uh, collect, what we collected for the data, we uh, sent the cell as minister uh, questionnaire, including personal information, uh, social economics, uh, eco social demo uh, graphics, medical his uh, history, uh, HBV co infection, and also risk factor for SCV infection. 
And uh, for the risk factor for SCV infection, we, we asked about blood uh, transfusion, tattooing, drug abuse, sharing needles, uh, and many, many things. And most of items were answered with yes, no, or don't know. And all specimens were screened for uh, anti-SCV and confirmed by uh, SCV RNA if um, the anti-SCV was positive. And laboratory results was revealed and then approved by a cert certified medical doctor at the medic uh, medical center. And I think you own this center. Uh, and sent to uh, participants within four weeks after screening. The SCV continuing the care construct was based on the questionnaire at the point of survey. Um, so what did we uh, what did we do for data analysis? First, we calculated expansion weight. That's we call design based weight based on BBS sampling design for each commune. And after that, its observation was applied, the expansion weight by the commune in which they live. And next, the base weights were adjusted for non response and early study uh, termination. And I will talk about early study uh, termination. And then the adjusted base weight was applied to each observation. And of course, for um, data analysis, we have a descriptive analysis. We um, reported the weighted frequencies and prevalence uh, were calculated. And then uh, we analyze uh, 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 by various analysis uh, that um, we uh, apply to, to guide the covariate selection for multi-logistic regression and multi-logistic regression were applied to find the independent factor associated with the um, uh, positive anti-SCV status. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we, we use the approach that we call a forward selection strategy to uh, apply to select the confounders. And the adjustment began with the edge and test, and then confounder was added one by one to the models. And the process stopped when the uh, variables uh, make less than 10% uh, difference in the main model effect. Um, missing data were assumed completely at random and not imputed. From the beginning, the target population uh, invited to the study, uh, we plan to invite up to 20,000. But uh, finally, we got only 88% uh, of that because 12 clusters were not reached due to the COVID-19 uh, restriction in Vietnam. Uh, you all know that uh, from early 2020, some registration um, were applied. And because of that, we cannot gather people at the community health center. So we decided that we stop there because uh, the, um, the number of, uh, I, I mean, the sample size is uh, enough to, uh, for uh, the to ensure the, the power to see the, uh, what we want to, to analyze. And uh, um, subsequently, we've got 83 upon 4% uh, had completed the um, multi-step screening survey and blood tests, and then were included for final analyzing. Uh, and because when we analyze data, we see that first, we need to count for uh, early termination. The second one, we need to count for the non-response rate. And the third one, 
because we uh, invite many people in the community to go to the community health center to help uh, uh, screening. But um, the majority, uh, we have the higher um, proportion uh, of female than male. And for this reason, first we, we need to, to calculate for the weight. And after that, we apply the weight into uh, the data so that we, the, the weighted prevalence of anti HCV positivity was about 1.3% uh, corresponding to uh, 298 uh, adults among 40,000 adults enrolled and included to uh, study analyzing. And of 298 adults with the positive anti-SCV who enrolled to the study, um, just about 80% agreed to have their serum store for SCV RNA testing. And among them, about 50% were positive. And one interesting point is the, uh, the birth cord born from uh, 1945 to 1964 had uh, a prevalence of positive anti scv of 3.6%, representing for 40% of all SCV cases in Ho Chi Minh City. I'm sorry that um, this arrow should be here. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is the birth cord, uh, 1945 to 1964. The prevalence of positive anti scv is 3.6%. And um, when we look at the birth order, we can see higher we can see a higher peak of um, uh, prevalence up to 6.6% in male here. And lower peak is 3.5% in female. And what happened here for those born during uh, 1950 to 1954? And we can also see another pick for male. This is for those who were born in uh, 1980 to 1984. Um, we're happy that what we found in line with uh, some other study, especially study uh, conducted in Vietnam. That is uh, one. A uh, study conducted in five regions from north to south of Vietnam in Hanoi, Hai Phong, Da Nang, Khanh Hoa, and Cần Thơ. And uh, the, the authors also found that SCV patients were born within a similar birth core period. Uh, and the message we got from this, that means uh, the screening of this Vietnam birth core followed by a treatment has been demonstrated a, a cost effective uh, strategy uh, toward uh, SCV elimination goals. And the uh, uh, putative increase in the prevalence of positive anti SCV in males born from uh, 1970 to 19. Uh, 94, uh, the, um, this problem can be uh, explained by uh, intravenous drug abuse. Uh, we, we suppose that intravenous drug abuse might be a driving factor. Uh, because when we try to compare to uh, other uh, studies and we see the evidence of re increase in SCV infections in, in uh, people who born 
uh, who inject drugs born around uh, 1980 compared with those born around 1976 in Haiphong. And the similar by, uh, by model distribution of SCV infection incident was also observed in uh, America with the first pick uh, in the paper uh, baby boomer birth score and the second pick in those with their uh, 20s or 30s attributed to drug use. However, this trend should interpret uh, with the culture. The future study with larger sample size for each uh, age group uh, should be encouraged. And the second interesting point we found from our uh, studies that is people with history of blood transfusion, uh, renal, dialysis, uh, advanced liver diseases, uh, drug use, needle sharing, et cetera, had um, a percentage about 2% or higher uh, anti-SCV prevalence. And the prevalence of positive NCV, uh, anti-SCV was uh, around um, 1.5 in uh, urban districts, uh, 0.7 in suburban districts, and 0.8 in rural districts. The highest uh, prevalence found in District 1 and surrounding areas, including District 3, uh, District 5, Tân Bình District. As you can see in this map, And uh, when we look at uh, 298 study participants with positive anti-SCV results, only 29% uh, reported knowing SCV prior to the study entry. And um, among them, uh, we got um, six people aware of SCV after experience, experiencing uh, charges, uh, why uh, 66 people were coincidentally diagnosed with uh, in routine health checkups or doctor visits. So, and among those aware of SCV disease, uh, 62 of 75 uh, initiated uh, treatment and three of 56 had been killed. So you can see among those who got positive anti-SCV, we got around 29% um, who aware of SCV status. And among those who are aware of SCV status, about 21% initiated treatment. And among those who already got initiated treatment, only 10% uh, uh, kill from the treatment. So a significant gap in disease uh, awareness among positive anti-SCV. That means only 29% of people with positive anti-SCV were aware of their SCV status. So if we compare with the target from WHO, this is lower from uh, lower than WHO target. But with 
82.5% of those aware of received treatment. This number shows that the WHO treatment targets for 2030 of 80% were achieved. And uh, we can say that these uh, data suggested that a person with SCV were aware of their infection status, they would likely seek healthcare, undergo treatment, and then get cured. Therefore, expanding SCV screening and diagnostic rate may be an essential strategy to work SCV elimination in Ho Chi Minh City. Of course, our every, like many study, our study uh, got some limitation. First, because of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, we cannot uh, uh, collect uh, the full sample size as we plan. We need to stop because we cannot uh, ask people to, to go to the community health center for survey. Uh, so that means we cannot reach to uh, 12 cluster in two urban districts, District 3 and District 9, and two rural districts uh, Nha Bè district and Cần Giờ district. Uh, but because the missing districts were balanced in terms of urban and rural areas and account for the weighted process, as I told you, we already start with uh, calculating the, uh, the weight. So in overall uh, estimates were expected to be minimal effective. And uh, the second uh, limitation is the role of commercial sets on SCV infections were not as a mean, because none of them with the history of having sets uh, with the sex worker had a positive anti-SCV, which was uh, likely underreported due to um, stigmatization. And finally, uh, this is just a cross-sectional study. And because this is like uh, the, the, the limitation of processional uh, design, uh, the nature of uh, like, uh, we, we cannot decide um, uh, the cost effect relationship. So the final message from this study, this study is the, I, I believe that this is the first study in Ho Chi Minh City with the uh, last scale study with the number of people as I mean up to uh, nearly 20,000 people. And this is a good document uh, to, to show people about the burden of SCV infection and its based like continuing of care in Ho Chi Minh City. And uh, we recommend um, uh, some uh, subpopulation for intervention are the birth core age uh, 1945 to 1964 and other groups with low proportion of testing and awareness such as uh, someone who use drug use, tattoo and share needles. And also some uh, geographical groups such as District 1 and surrounding urban districts in Ho Chi Minh City. And um, I think that the future study in Vietnam should uh, progress, uh, pro, uh, prospectively capture the gaps among different steps of cascade of uh, care to monitor the progress um, to work uh, SCB elimination by 2030. Thank you for your reason. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hong. And um, now we will move on to the panel discussion. 
And today we will have two uh, panelists uh, for the panel uh, for the afternoon panel discussion, Dr. Tan Kim Hong and Dr. Grover Skish. Uh, welcome. Good afternoon. This is Dr. Gish. I'm here to work with Dr. Hong and work through questions and answers. Do we have questions from the audience or coming through the Q&A chat? I also have some comments and questions myself. Is my audio okay? We can hear you very well. Yes, yes. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gish and go home for the great presentation. So my first question will go to Dr. Gish. Uh, Dr. Gish, in the French early uh, study where they investigate boulevard type and boulevard type plus back into Peron, I think there's a significant number of patients who do not have suppressed HDV RNA, even especially in the treatment of boulevard type, two milligram. So I wonder if the patients who do not have suppressed HDV RNA, do you think it might be because of the resistance against the drug, as it is a direct antiviral, or do you think there's maybe just other reasons um, that do not allow a complete response in those pa patients? Thank you. This is a great question, and it really points at the mechanism of action of Bulevitar, which is working on a host mechanism, not a direct antiviral agent. It's not a DAA. And by working at the NTCP receptor at this host target, it's uh, preventing uptake of new virus into liver cells. To date, there has not been any evidence of resistance to belevertide, and it may be a little difficult to document this, uh, but you might see changes in the receptor that would make belevertide less effective. Uh, there's also another theory that when you give belevertide, uh, as we showed in one of the slides, you see increased bile acid levels. And these bile acid levels, the change may have an effect on the interaction of the virus and the receptor. It also may lead to an increased number of receptors. Uh, so and there's also one other step um, before binding to the NTCP receptor. There's a glycoprotein that is next to the NTCP receptor that's involved with uptake. And there may be a difference in that first step process before the second step of binding to the uptake receptor. These are some of the theories, but we're not expecting any significant drug resistance. It may have to do with viral load. Some patients have very high Delta virus RNA levels, and there may be some heterogeneity in the NTCP receptor also that may make glulevertide less effective, but this would be a host uh, variability. Uh, that may be predicted uh, through some type of either direct receptor assays or through some type of genome sequencing. And my second question go to Kohom. Thank you, Kohom, for the great talk. I'm just curious why the patients born between 1945 and 1964 have a high rate of anti-HCV. And do you think is it because of blood transfusion for those who born during that time where we do not have a test to screen for HCV before blood transfusion? And, uh, and the second question is, I'm surprised with the failure rate of patients who were treated for HCV in the study. Uh, the, the response rate is just around 50%, even though with the high rate of DAA, right, like we know right now, the, the cure rate should be even more than 95%. So do you have any explanation for those who failed the treatment uh, in the study? Thank you. So um, 
Thank you, Thuy. Uh, I was asked to be in companion, companion with Dr. Hong, and we worked together, so um, she asked if I can have uh, answer this. Uh, so the answer is likely yes to your question. The first question regarding um, the uh, lack of blood transfusion in that cohort uh, before the time. Uh, but we don't know for sure. Um, you know, other uh, speculations includes maybe during the Vietnam War, uh, these individuals exposed to traumas, um, uh, infections from American troops, for example. Um, so the final answer is maybe, but we don't know for sure. Uh, regarding the second questions, um, even though the DAA um, effectiveness and efficacy is, is over 95%, uh, but in our patient population, we only observe uh, 50 to 60%. Um, I don't think we, we know for sure. However, when we uh, call back these uh, individuals and uh, we learn that some of them didn't even complete the tr treatment course, uh, and some of them uh, didn't follow up um, the whole um, uh, treatment course with, uh, uh, you know, confirmatory tests uh, after 12 weeks, for example. So the treatment algorithms uh, was incomplete in, in many of them. Um, also, uh, this study was um, based on a survey. So there might have been some biases in um, re recollections uh, of the data. Uh, I just want to uh, ask some more things. Um, uh, because you see that uh, uh, I, I, I try to, to explain about the uh, birth cohort effect. Uh, and uh, uh, this happened to, to the birth cohort. Uh, so as uh, Yuan said, we, we're not sure what happened to that birth cohort, but we recognize that there's something uh, happened with that birth cohort. And uh, not only in our study, but also in other studies, we, we recognize uh, the higher prevalence of SCV infections uh, for this birth cohort. Uh, so for this, we, we, I think we need some more study to, to define and um, to explore more what happened but at least we, uh, what we call this is a birth cohort effect. I'd like to add, if I may, um, in the US, uh, we kind of have the same um, phenomena. 75% um, of all hep C carriers in the US are in the same birth cohort. Um, and uh, blood transfusion uh, exposure to unsterilized um, medical uh, devices are some of the explanations. And that's why when we designed a study, we hypothesized whether uh, the birth cohort in the US may uh, present in uh, the Vietnamese population. So uh, in our study, we observe uh, somewhat a similar phenomena. Um, so, um, first of all, I have to say that I, I, I just read the paper on Lancet a few days ago, and congratulations, and uh, I really, um, really enjoyed reading the paper. Um, so, and I don't think, I, actually, I, 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 I will start with a few comments first. I don't think um, doing a cross-sectional study is a limitation of the, of, of the paper, because I think your main question is to answer um, is to is to explore the the the, the frequency and um, the prevalence of um, positive NTHCV. I don't think it's a it's needed to have like you know longitudinal study or even clinical trials. So I think it's okay for cross section of study. Um, I have another comment about the hypothesis on uh, I, being IDU as a major contributor to the peaks uh, that you observe in the birth cohorts. Um, I think it's, it's quite easy to ex explore that, for example, asking a patient, uh, sorry, a person whether they had a history of IDU, and then maybe you calculated the prevalence of the IDUs in each birth cohort to see whether they really contributed to the major portion uh, in that cohort. Uh, so, so I think it's easy to show that, and maybe you might want to look 
you know, further into your data to see that. Um, I have a question for Dr. Hong about the, the higher prevalence of uh, positive NTHCV in District 1, because I think it's the very highly developed district in Ho Chi Minh City, so why is the higher prevalence? Um, I think that, I, I just want to ask you, have you heard about uh, Khu Mã Lãng? Uh, actually, if someone who lived for a long time in Ho Chi Minh City, and uh, we all, I think you know this, this area. Uh, this is an area, um, looks like a triangular area. Nguyễn uh, Trái, uh, Nguyễn Cư Trinh, and... Um, Cannot, Dr. Tsai, can you help me? In the district tree, and uh, it's um, um, nearly, it's the corner between uh, uh, Nguyễn Trái and Cống Quỳnh, you know? Yeah, and it's the nearly the Trung Thủy group, it's a building. It's a new building, Trung Thủy Group. It's a uh, uh, in uh, in the the Nguyễn Trãi Street. You know, so a... uh, maybe you are <laughs> so young to, to know this, but in the past, Khu Mã Lãng is uh, one of the area with uh, many social problems, especially the uh, um, like uh, drug user and uh, yeah. So I I think because um, even though uh, District 1 is a, um, a district with um, a high, highly economic uh, development, right? But um, actually, uh, there are some areas with um, that, uh, that was included in the, the study. So that is uh, one reason. And um, for your first comment, um, uh thank you for your comment but um because for the cross-sectional survey we already examined the risk factor and because the the results of risk factor i didn't uh, present it here so maybe it may confuse you and you think that um for cross-sectional study we we can get the prevalence that is okay so it's not a limitation but uh, actually um, because we also, or, uh, also examine the risk factor and we just uh, try to find the risk factor and um, yeah, for um, uh, many uh, study design, the cross-sectional study has its uh, limitation to, 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 to say about the, the um, cause-effect relationship. So we need more study to, uh, to uh, explore more about the, the cost effect relationship. Thank you. And um, so, do you think the HCV infection in Ho Chi Minh City is um, is concentrate, concentrated in uh, a few areas or is it scattered all around the city? Based on the data, uh, based on the result of uh, data analysis, uh, we found that the higher prevalence among uh, uh, the, uh, the urban district more than uh, uh, semi-urban or rural districts. Uh, so I think we may pay more attention uh, or we uh, may um, explore or conduct uh, we, we may do something more to, 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 to explore uh, and uh, confirm about this, uh, about the, uh, the result we, we found. And um, I, although I don't have um, a lot of knowledge about uh, HCV previously, I worked at a unit of dialysis. So um, Dialysis is also one, one risk factor for HCV infection. So do you think maybe we need to look at, you know, a certain 
diseases or certain occupations where they might be had, you know, extremely higher risk of HCV? Uh, yeah, long um, to add to Dr. Hong's um, answer, we did see a, a wide variation of Hep C prevalence among the districts in Ho Chi Minh City. For example, District One and Four uh, had a prevalence of four to five percent, and then some other districts had zero um, um, prevalence. Yeah, and that's why we propose. You know, maybe uh, you don't get. Uh, treat Ho Chi Minh City as a whole, as a one size fits all. For the micro -elim elimination concept, uh, you wanted to target to the areas or the populations with the highest prevalence. So you get uh, the best, uh, the most effective results. Uh, regarding your uh, uh, question uh, on renal dialysis, we did analyze when we didn't, we initially hypothesized that would, uh, that um, this, uh, renal dialysis group would have higher prevalence, uh, but in the um, uh, final an analysis, we didn't observe that. Uh, and we uh, speculate that that might have been due to a blood uh, screening uh, or the screening process um, during the analysis. I had one question about the treatment of the patients in your study, Yuan and Dr. Hong. One of the statements was there were people who are antibody positive, RNA negative, who underwent treatment with DAA. Can we explain why you would treat a patient who's RNA negative, or did I misread? Uh, thank you, Dr. Gish. I, I think um, there might have been a, a misunderstanding. Um, so of the patients who had anti-Hep C positivity, um, we uh, test for their Hep C RNA, and we found only about 50 or so percent had anti-Hep C RNA positivity. So the other group with the Hep C RNA negativity, about 50% uh, of them had already had the treatment um, before they entered the study. So uh, if you look at the uh, active viremia uh, of the Hep C antibody um, positive patients in Ho Chi Minh City, you um, can um, um, derived as at like around 70% to 75%, uh, which is uh, similar to other uh, studies in other countries. Thank you. Uh, yeah, good job. Um... Ờ, quý thầy cô, quý anh chị, quý đồng nghiệp Thì à, em muốn hỏi là Tại vì các cái bài trình bày á, Thì em có thấy các thầy cô có đề, có nói đến cái interferon á. Thì em à, muốn hỏi là cái à, So với bên cạnh các cái thuốc đường uống Như là NTKV hay là à, Tenofovir á, Thì à, cái thực tế áp dụng lâm sàng Trong điều trị cái à, interferon này ở Việt Nam như thế nào à, Và em có nghe bài trình bày của thầy Dũng Thì có nói về cái tác dụng phụ và cái tỷ lệ mà có thể chữa khỏi uh, bằng interferon đó, thì em muốn hỏi là uh, cái tỷ lệ này ở Việt Nam này nó như thế nào? Em xin cảm ơn. Uh, cảm ơn Tuấn. Uh, Tuấn là hỏi về siêu hoang sơ đúng không? Sử dụng interferon trong siêu hoang sơ. Just for Dr. Gish, um, uh, a participant questions um, regarding the response rate of uh, using interferon in hep C treatment, even though it's... Uh, probably no longer indicated. Um, so interferon uh, use in hep C treatment, the overall response rate after about one year of interferon injection is about 50%. And it depends on the genotype, et cetera. It used to be that patient with genotype three had uh, the best response. Uh, nowadays, I don't think uh, any Really, virtually uh, nobody uses interferon for hep C treatment um, anymore because we have really effective uh, direct acting agents or DAA with the uh, uh, cure rate at least 95%. Thank you. 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 Th
uh, the side effects of interference include it's a, an, um, an immune stimulator. So you uh, expect to feel like really like feel unwell, uh, flu-like symptom, mud, muscle ache, uh, fever. Uh, some people also de develop uh, depression and some individual also develop um, anemia, low blood count. You have anything else to add, Dr. Rish? I agree with your statement about hepatitis C. C is in cat. Interferon has no role currently. The hepatitis B world is a little bit different. Hepatitis B is in boy. Treatment with interferon monotherapy resulted in a potentially 10 to 12% rate of S loss and DNA negative. There are a number of companies that are using interferon in the new drug development world to be the fourth pillar of being an immunomodulator. But I think even in that setting, like hepatitis C, the side effects are going to make it difficult to use interferon in a large population, and we're looking for better immunomodulators. That's really the next wave in B, and probably ultimately in Delta. I do think, as I mentioned, with Delta, interferon, will be part of treating Delta with Bulevertite that will be on the label, but I think that's what will be done in practice. And as you know, interferon is a key part of the DELIVER studies, other studies with lonafarnib for Delta that's being developed by Iger. So interferon, I think, will be on our radar for B and Delta for the next five years or so until we come up with better immunotherapies. The immune system is critical in managing and clearing and controlling hepatitis B and Delta. Thank you, Dr. Gish. Sorry to bother you again, but um, I just wonder the correlation between intrahepatic HDV RNA levels and plasma HDV RNA levels, because I see in one study, people measure plasma HDV RNA levels, and in another study, they measure intrahepatic HDV RNA level. And uh, the one remark is, I believe HDV RNA level is not really highly correlated with liver progression, with the progression of liver disease. So whether you think that HDV RNA should be the final biomarker uh, for the efficacy of treatment, including bulovertide or lunafanib, or you think maybe we should have another biomarker to, to really confirm the efficacy of the treatment? Thank you. It's a fantastic question. And I think you were focusing on Delta RNA and it is the Delta RNA level that is correlated with outcomes in Delta hepatitis. So the higher the level, the higher the risk of cancer, cirrhosis, transplant, and death, and the lower the level, especially if you have greater than a two log reduction in serum levels of Delta RNA, you have a much better prognosis. And that's why we have this combined endpoint uh, for EMEA, FDA, and other regulatory approval. Uh, an RNA that decreases by two logs or becomes undetectable with a normal ALT. I think that's the best we have right now. Um, liver tissue delta RNA has been uh, researched, especially by Stefan Urban and other researchers, including Fabian Zulim. And what's happening with delta in the liver itself is still uh, confusing. Um, but ultimately, it's the packaging of the delta, the level in the blood, and then infection of new hepatocytes that's really key. Because remember, bulevertide works by blocking new infection. There's turnover of liver cells. Certain liver cells are dying. They're being cleared of delta RNA. But new liver cells are being infected, and that results in the propagation of delta infection. Uh, so it's a complicated answer, but it, the serum levels is the best we have. I don't think we'll be doing liver sampling at any time in the future. And we have a good surrogate today. I'm sure they'll be better in the future, but we need to consider Delta is incurable, just like hepatitis B is not curable. But once we get to a higher rate of functional cure, which is a little bit of an abnormal word because it's not really a cure, it's just S loss and DNA undetectable, we may reach a better stage or better phase of Delta management 
with maintained virologic response, MVR, off treatment. That means delta RNA undetectable in the blood. Until we cure B, we won't be curing delta. And we need to live with what I think is our best assay, delta RNA quant. We can talk about that in more detail. It's not a perfect test because of genotyping and assay and primer differences. But uh, the current test for delta RNA, the commercial tests, the laboratory determined tests are very high quality in my opinion. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gish. Thank you, Dr. Hong and Dr. Zuan. Um, so I think we uh, we have come to the, the end of our conference today. What a fruitful conference. Uh, we have listened to 11 presentations on important topics of viral hepatitis and liver cancer. And there have been many interesting questions and comments from the panelists and audiences. We hope that the participants have been provided with a comprehensive perspective on viral hepatitis and liver cancer and have been extremely motivated to implement and participate in research projects in the field. Thank you for your participation and we wish you health and success. Uh, và bây giờ thì um, rất xin cảm ơn sự tham gia của các đại biểu uh, có mặt trong hội trường ngày hôm nay thì rất là mong muốn là chúng ta sẽ lên và chụp một bức ảnh kỷ niệm cùng với nhau ạ. Thank you Dr. Kitch. Bye. Thế chúng em cảm ơn thầy, em chào thầy ạ.